just do Impact so I can get into a bad mood right before I go to bed. I feel like Lance that one day I made him watch this show. <laughs> then he went back to the hotel and couldn't sleep. Well, what can you do? So, as noted, I did not watch this program last week. And I said before that, in some ways that's a positive. Because when you don't watch the show the week before, then when nothing makes sense, it's like, well, I didn't watch the show last week. Fine theory. Fortunately, I did watch the show last week, and I'm well aware that nothing on this fucking show made a goddamn lick of sense. It opened up with them announcing that the main event tonight was going to be a tag match with the four guys in the finals of the World Title Tournament on Sunday. Jeff Hardy, Kurt Angle, The Pope, and Mr. Anderson. Mm -hmm. Can't believe I actually remembered that. And the big story was that Everybody backstage thought the booking of the match was stupid. Right. That's legitimately what the the story was here, mm-hmm. it, which is funny because it was far from the dumbest thing they've done. So Hogan, Hogan and Eric came Hogan out. came out. Hogan said that this match would prove we'd find out tonight which of these guys deserve to be champion. Mm-hmm. A lie. Hogan and Eric came out. And by the way, if the match is going to determine which guy deserves to be champion, then why isn't the title just on the line? I don't, I don't, don't know. I don't know. Fucking morons. Hogan and Eric came out. Hogan put over all the great talent backstage. Then he called out the Fatal Four. That's what we called them. Fatal Four. wonder where he got that term. So, Angle is called the greatest wrestler in the world. He's not the champion, mind you. But he's the greatest wrestler in the world. And came out, Hogan did a promo, and he said, What happened to RVD, we all know. We all know what happened. You men must raise the bar. And what happened to RVD, he said, it can never happen again. So I'm sitting there thinking, well, if you don't want that to ever happen again, why don't you fire Abyss, or at the very least, suspend him, or, or even charge him? There, there are a million things that you can do, but they have done nothing. And as I'm thinking this, out comes Abyss with his bat, mm-hmm. which got a tepid reaction, the reaction you would get if you did an angle at an indie show in front of 20 people. He yeah. came out... He started ranting about them. Even before that, he wanted basically for attempted murder on Rob Van Dam. He killed all their best friend and their champion. No, he's not wanted. They don't care. That's the key. <laughs> yes, because he calmly climbed into the ring. Everyone just looked at him. Mm-hmm. They were not angry. No. They were not scared. No. They were mildly curious. So he starts talking about them, and Elgin says, listen, we know who them is. It's Flair and his bunch of idiots. And Abyss said, No. That's not them. It's not EV2, and it's not Fortune. He said they told him the chess pieces were in place, the plan was ready to proceed, and the date it was going to happen was 10-10-10. A date, he said. Get this. A date that only comes once every century. As opposed to 10-9-10, which is most Tuesdays. It only comes once a century. Ten, ten, ten. Yes. Really. Very profound. Yeah. So, so today, uh, ten or nine, three, ten. That comes more than once a century. Apparently. Hmm. It's news to me. So. So anyway, he said when they arrived, they weren't going to just take over TNA. They were going to remove Dixie Carter <clears throat> and uh, continue the systematic extermination of Hogan, Eric, everybody in the ring. He's in the middle of ranting and raving, and they cut to commercial now. I immediately thought, well, that was stupid. He's in the middle of a rant, and they cut to commercial. How rude. So I figured they'd come back, and he, you know, this, this angle would continue. Wrong. It just, <laughs> yes. I don't know what happened during the commercial, but he was in the middle of ranting. They went to commercial, and then it was just over. It's actually even worse than that, because right when they faded to, faded to black, the very last thing we saw was Jeff Hardy punch a bis in the head. And then we came back and there was no resolution. Yeah. So don't ask us what happened. Also, Hogan and Eric came out at the beginning. They did not come out alone. They were accompanied by the fabled Miss Tessmacher. I was stunned this woman was still employed. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much she has been paid. I do know there's no way to justify her salary. So they hired this woman to be a hot-looking babe and then never shown her. In some cases, literally never shown her on television, and then never shown her looking hot. So she finally comes out. She's got a plenty neckline and a very tight skirt, and she's about to climb into the ring, and they cut away from her to a fat geek in the crowd, mm-hmm. and they stayed on him for a long time. Yeah. This company is amazing. 
Velvet and Angelina against Madison and the motorcycle chick. They introduced the beautiful people, but out came Madison and the motorcycle chick, which led to nothing except the other introduction on a tape show. So somebody missed their cue here, and they didn't bother to fix it. So not much heat. Got worse with each passing second. The finish was Motorcycle Girl hits Velvet with helmet leading to pin. I'm sure that was in, was in the script. What happened was the motorcycle chick being out of position and then dropping the helmet and then hitting the girl with the helmet so lightly that why even bother? I'm not saying she should have hit her hard, but why even bother? Why not trip her or yes. something? Uh, yeah, why yeah. would you tell her to hit her with the helmet and it's going to look that horrendous? This was worse than 99% of finishes on bad indie shows. Yes, the, the, the description I had was Ghost, Ghost Rider hits Velvet with a helmet behind the rest back for the win. This is giving them way too much credit. So then the winners were announced as, and I quote, Madison and her official bodyguard. So after winning, the motorcycle chick unmasked. She voluntarily took off her mask, and it was Tara. She did not put the mask on the line. She did not unmask at the pay-per-view. She didn't even get unmasked after an embarrassing moment, like CM Punk at the big show. No. She she beat up the baby faces, and then she just said, here's who I am. Which caused the announcers, Mike Cheney, to calmly say, we have not seen Tara in months. And he mentioned that the last time we saw her, she'd lost a loser, must retire from TNA match, and they did not question this any further. She's just back now. So the obvious question is, why was she wearing a mask in the first place? You know why? No. Well, I don't know why she was wearing the mask. But what happened, because they're so fucking stupid, is they... Her contract was expiring, and I guess they didn't think she was going to continue. So they announced a loser must retire match, and then they re-signed her. Okay. And did not know what to do at that point. I'm in, in storyline. Why did Tara, not Lisa Veron, why did Tara decide I must wear a mask? To help her get over on the baby faces, I guess. Hmm. I don't know. Okay. There is no good, there is no logical reason for it. Because That's... there's no logical reason for anything that happens on this show. That is true. So we had a Stevie Richards promo. No, stop. We had a segment where everybody was talking about how ridiculous it was that Abyss had killed RVD. Was that Stevie? Uh, Maybe. that... I think the, I think you I, I think you have the next two segments slightly out of order. Anyway, but we had uh, the everybody talking about how ridiculous it was that Abyss had killed RVD, but still no punishment for for Abyss. So then, and this is awesome, they announced that next week we're going to hear from RVD for the first time since this happened. They don't say via phone. We're supposed to presume that he's going to be there. I don't know if he's going to be there, but you he gets hurt. You strip him of the title. You do a tournament for the championship, and then he's going to be back three days later? Right. Okay, the problem is he's also not going to be back three days later or four days later or even seven days later because, you see, they announced that he's going to be there on next week's show, but there is no show next week. Impact is preempted next week. This news has been out for days. They could not edit this off the show. They could not remove this. They could not They could not do anything except be moronic. So, yeah, next week on the show that doesn't air, RVD is not going to be there. Correct. So we have the Stevie Richards promo. He was saying he was not afraid of Abyss, not after all the surgeries and broken necks he had been through, and he vowed to step out of the shadow of his comrades and stand on his own. This is a fine promo. Brian, you missed last week's show. There was a segment where Stevie Richards and Abyss brawled for about five minutes. At the end, they were still brawling. So he had no reason to be afraid of Abyss. He had already fought him to a standstill. Abyss came out with the nail-covered board and faced Stevie Richards. Now, not only does he still have the board that he used to kill the world heavyweight champion, but they are so upset with what he has done that not only did they not suspend him, but they are currently booking him in wrestling matches. Right. No, 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 not just wrestling matches. Pay-per-view. Yeah. They're not hiding him in dark matches. So they have a match. He beats the hell out of Stevie, of course. And then Stevie super kicks a chair 
into a business face and pins abyss. Stevie Richards pinned abyss. Why? I have absolutely no idea. Why because not? Immediately afterwards, Abyss no sold the pinfall, destroyed Stevie Richards, and as he's destroying him, they cut backstage, and there's Mick Foley on the ground. Eight million men are surrounding him. They cut back, and they claim that the reason they did that was to show that EV 2.0 was busy backstage and could not save Stevie. Now they suddenly care about logic. <laughs> Why fucking bother at this point? So Stevie's getting beaten up. All these guys are apparently busy. So who should run to make the save but Ryan Kendrick, which makes no sense. There you go. There's also a point in here where they were talking about uh, a business pay-per-view match. You see he's going to be wrestling Rhino in a Falls Count Anywhere match. So the idea is that you will pay money to see Rhino and Abyss brawl all over the building. Mike May then reminded us that last week we saw Rhino and Abyss for free brawl all over the building. And in fact... We saw Rhino hit a gore and leave Abyss Lane. Mm-hmm. We have already seen this match with a decisive winner. Yeah. Now we have to pay to see it again. Anderson and Pope had the meeting where Pope told Anderson, we don't have to like each other, but we need to get along tonight. You've heard it 78 million times in strip wrestling. He also, Anderson told Pope, if I screw you, then I screw me. What? I don't know. All right. By the way, this was where I noticed we were only 42 minutes into this program. <laughs> sad, sad time that was. Fully, Dreamer, Sabu, and Rhino are in the ring. Dreamer does a promo. Says that Fortune wants to fight in the back and hurt Foley. Why not get their asses out and do it right now? So Fortune comes out. They have new music. I don't know if it was this music last week, but it is a techno version of Ric Flair's music in 2010. <laughs> this is up there with Candice Michelle's old song. It's, well, no. It's, yeah. it's not good. A techno version of Ric Flair's music? This did not mean Why would angry. you have this techno in 2010? Stupid. A techno version of 2001 in 2010. <laughs> Hello? So, out comes AJ. He buries all the guys in the ring. I will say, the positive on this show, AJ Styles' promos have improved approximately 800 million percent. He has improved by miles. A complete 180, as Alan would say. Dreamer said... You know, you guys don't have to wait for the pay-per-view. We can do it right now. And I thought, no, you should wait for the pay-per-view. You are a horrible booker. So they run down, and AJ starts taking off his jacket. They start heading to the ring for the match, and they cut to the back. And there's Jarrett doing a promo with Joe. I have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. And then they announce, Sting and Jarrett are next. So I guess AJ took off his jacket, went to the ring, and then they all just went backstage. I mean, he just took off his jacket and then put it right back on. Sure. He did while he was talking. His promo was, was great anyway, but he also plugged three separate matches in the pay-per-view. He said Doug Williams would massacre Sabu, said Abyss would slaughter Rhino, and that he would beat Tommy in the I Quit match. So this promo was a win. We had a god-awful segment. Crumbly. All of you TNA-loving goofballs. Please explain this to me. Jared said that the reason he had to do this was because Nash and Sting would tear down the company otherwise. Now, had to do this is in reference to performing in a wrestling match. So, if he does not wrestle Sting in a match, Sting is going to take down TNA. How? How? Why? Does Sting I don't know. have an in with Spike where he can convince them to cancel the television program? Does he have an in with Bob Carter? Does he have pictures of Bob Carter cheating on his wife? I don't know. Does he have something that he's holding over Bob Carter's head? How is Sting going to kill TNA? And how is Jeff Jarrett having a wrestling match going to stop it? I, I don't know. If anyone has the answers to these questions, alert me immediately. They then had the match. Get this finish. Oh, and by the way, they announced during this match that the the EV2 versus Fortune was going to be an elimination match, which I saw Monday on Raw. Just want to throw that in there. So, they have this match, Jarrett and Sting. It's bad. And then the finish is the old finish where the babyface tries to suplex the heel inside but the manager grabs the babyface's foot and trips him and then holds down the foot so the heel gets the pin. 
Unfortunately, Kevin Nash was the manager, the tallest manager there's ever been. Jared goes to suplex Sting into the ring. Nash trips him. Sting falls on top. Nash proceeds to walk away. Jeff Jarrett is laying there, trapped <laughs> under the 220-pound bulk of Sting. Yes. He cannot kick out. He looked like the biggest buffoon with this finish. A complete idiot. And then heels jumped him. Hogan came out on the ramp, which, by the way, ultimately led to nothing. And then Joe ran in through the crowd and saved the day. We were an hour in at this point. I've been talking seemingly for ten years. <laughs> I have decided, and I don't want to say this with emotion, I just want to say this fact, that Jeff Jarrett versus Sting Kevin Nash is the worst feud I've ever seen. It's it, none of it me. makes any sense. They were talking openly, not making this up. The announcers during this match were talking about how they don't know what's going on and all the fans are confused. And also in the middle of this, as Nash tripped Jarrett four or five times, Taz explained the ref should get Kevin Nash out of there. Yeah. So yes. no one cared. No one cares. If if they cared, their only reaction would be complete befuddlement. But since they don't care, they don't care. They just move on. The Shore is coming. It's Jersey Shore ripoff, but they can't say Jersey Jersey Shore, so it's just the Shore. <laughs> Dina, everybody. Out came Brutus Magnus doing an Austin Aries gimmick, and Nigel McGuinness doing a Desmond Wolf gimmick in Chelsea, and. Brutus did a promo, bearing the machine guns. Fans chanted, shut the fuck up. Machine guns came out. They all took turns burying each other. Guns called him gay. They hit on Chelsea. Desmond didn't manage he tell the world about the size of his manhood. And she said, in the same voice, the same facial expressions, she's like a prettier version of Dixie Carter. She said, if this was a sword fight, you would come up short. And Desmond got all mad so mad at what his girl said that he beat up the guns. This was actually far more entertaining than it sounds. <laughs> but the promo, it was written, I believe, by and for 10-year-old boys. Gay jokes, penis jokes, violence. What more could you ask for? Video games. Video games. <laughs> Cheetos. But uh, the only thing I hated about this, and I really, really hated this, Desmond Wolf and Magnus have a tag match at the pay-per-view, a title match at the pay-per-view, and they explain that they're the number one contenders, even though I have never seen the team before once in my life. So then they told me how they had earned this title shot. You see, they said, they had been winning match after match after match on explosion <laughs> to prove they were the best team. Yeah. None of these matches, not one second, not one clip, not one move, not one pinfall, not one celebration, nothing has been shown on impact. Yeah. I guess this would be like Jake Shields getting a 170-pound title shot in his first match in UFC. No, I, which he's not, by the way. Well, if he did, there would be a hype special, and guys would at least talk about it. Uh, they, they would tell us specifically what they've done. I guess the, I guess you could say this was a hype special done in four seconds. So backstage, the EVD 2.0 guys were discussing Foley, who was hurt. Kendrick happened to walk in at just the right moment and offered to take the place. Dreamer was. Not really down with this, but fully stuck up for him, so it was on. Dreamer and Sabu and Rhino and Kendrick against AJ, Kazarian, and Beer Money. This was like an old-school Survivor Series match, where you put stars in the ring, it's an elimination match, and you got to get it over with quickly so guys do jobs for atomic drops. We had <laughs> Sabu running wild, Douglas tripped him, and Kazarian used a roll-up for the pin, which Taz immediately questioned. Was that really a three? Awesome. So he got pinned by a trip. Looked like a dork. Then Douglas beat him up afterwards. So they beat on Kendrick for a while. He makes his own comeback. He then proceeds to pin Frankie Kazarian with a drop kick. He leaps into the air. He kicks the man and drops a drop kick, and he wins over him. Yeah. So then he keeps trying to choke Kazarian afterwards. The ref goes to pull him off, and so he drop kicks the ref, I guess, for the DQ. It broke down into a brawl. Foley started limping down the ramp. Beer got spat in someone's face, but I have no idea who it was because it just immediately cut to commercial. They come back. More action. They announce Nash and Sting against Jarrett and Joe for Sunday. Thank fucking God I'm watching Bull and not this show. 
Rhino runs wild on beer money. Gore storm. Rude breaks it up. Abyss goes to gore him, but... I'm sorry, Rhino this goes to gore him. him. <laughs> but Abyss came out and went after him, so the ref counts out Rhino. He's chasing Abyss. I know, he's, he's trading punches with Abyss. Sure. This is not a DQ. So, then Dreamer pinned Rude with a DDT after AJ screwed up. Dreamer rolled up Storm for the pin. It comes down to AJ and Dreamer, the two guys wrestling on Sunday. I guess for the title, apparently. What a preview this was. They did a bunch of submissions since it's an I quit match. And, of course, nobody submitted, so way to go. And then Dreamer puts AJ in the figure four. Matt Morgan runs down. Dreamer attacks him in the ring, which is not a DQ. Foley goes after Flair outside, and somehow AJ pins Dreamer with a Pele. This was a complete clusterfuck. I will tell you how, and I only noticed with this sort of replay. Tommy turned around, and AJ poked him in the eye. Tommy was blinded and stunned. AJ then decided, what I will do here is I will turn my back to you and then do a full flip and kick you in the face. Mm-hmm. Wacky. Watch this match and then watch the Raw WWE versus Nexus match on Monday. It's night and day. That was better. How to put together an elimination match. These guys have absolutely no idea what they're doing. These agents are completely clueless, and the wrestlers aren't good enough to figure it out, apparently, because this was a just disaster, this was. Probably because they had them do eight fucking million things. There is more! Pope and Anderson against Hardy and Angle. During this match, they plugged Reaction coming up next. Who could possibly watch another hour of TNA after this? <laughs> Not I. LSD would be easier on your brain than this third hour of Reaction after this two-hour show. So, Hardy accidentally hits Kurt with a twist of fate. Anderson hits Angle with the mic check. Pope steals the pin. Never could have seen that fucking finish coming. Not a million years. They said if that happened to Kurt Sunday, he'd have to retire. Because, you know, if he loses before he wins the title, he has to retire. But it doesn't count here because this is a tag match, not the singles. Yeah. Yeah. There was a segment earlier where Jeff and Kurt were discussing this, that if Jeff Hardy beats Kurt, Kurt has to retire. And they, they were talking about it the way you might discuss, should we go to McDonald's or Burger King? The same gravity. Jeff and Kurt got in a brawl, which Kurt got the better of. And I'll say. Mean, better <laughs> of. He took him down, he tied him in knots, and he punched him really hard in the, the head. That's the best part of the show. Poor Jeff. And then the show mercifully was over. What a horrible television show. It really was bad. I'll say it again. They title these shows. They title them. They title them because they consider them to be art. They consider them to be good. Well, guess what? They're not. Your shows suck. To the back! I do not want you to run down the entire TNA pay-per-view, because... I don't want to do it either. <laughs> I don't really like TNA, everybody. But you should at least tell everybody a little bit about the top matches on the show and some of the the earth-shattering angles that went down on this particular evening. Why should they even have earth-shattering angles? Uh, we had the Machine Gun versus Generation Me. It was explained that London Brawling was not there due to, due to a personal issue. So they had a good match, no surprise. I went three and a half stars. It was like every Motor City ma- uh, match ever where the wrestling's really good, but then it should be better. They had the heat on Shelley, and uh, he hit some counters and laid them out. And rather than do the all the men down and they build, do the dramatic build of the hot tag, he immediately left his feet and tagged in Saban. And it just, I was like, all right, whatever. So it was a very good match, which should have been better. And then afterwards, they did an angle where Generation Me laid them out. So they are now heels. Good. Evil, evil men. This, by the way, after uh, Mike and Nahum were talking about what good Christian men they were earlier in this match. Mm-hmm. So way to go, DNA. Uh, they hit Shelly with a double elevated DDT off the apron of the floor. And uh, he was incapacitated. And then two guys came out, and they lifted him up, and, and they helped him walk to the back. No stretcher job, no neck brace, but they did something. So that was all right. You had Douglas Williams versus Sabu in a very sloppy match. All sorts of blown spots and uh, 400 dives. And uh, Sabu went through a table. A chair got used until it was time for the ref to not let them use it. Then he pulled it away, and Williams won the belt shot. It was missable. Madison Rain had a crappy match with Velvet Sky. It was bad. Somebody won. Uh, Velvet won. So they didn't even bother building a challenger to the title unless Velvet's going to challenge Angelina right after they got back together. That was bad. 
We had Rhino and Abyssiny Falls coming anywhere match. Uh, they hit each other with stuff. They went through a wall on the stage, under the ramp, and then out a wall on the other side of the stage. There were no thumbtacks. There was no glass. Uh, they did not use a table after Sabu did. They used a guardrail, and uh, Rhino went for a gore, hit the guardrail, and turned around into a black hole slam for the pin. The place was going crazy for the finish. It was fine. He had a lot of notes on that match. A Kevin Nash and Sting versus Jeff Jarrett and Samoa Joe. All I remember about this was the announcers going on and on and on about how none of this made any sense, and they don't know what's going on. And they wish they could tell us what was going on, because they know the fans are confused, too. So uh, Jarrett hit Sting with a bat, and Joe choked him out, and that was that. We had AJ Styles versus, versus Tommy Dreamer in an equip match. They also used all sorts of weapons. The only thing I remember here was the finish, which was AJ got a fork, much like Abdullah the Butcher, and he held it into Tommy Dreamer's eyeball. Much like Abdullah the Butcher, you say. The only time ever I would ever say those words, but yes, a- a- AJ was like Abdullah here, and he held the fork into Dreamer's eyeball. It looks pretty gruesome. Dreamer was squealing and screaming when he quit, so it was effective. And uh, I was that. I was I was really really drunk by this point, so I can't tell you how good that was. We had the best match of the show by leaps and bounds: Kurt Angle versus Jeff Hardy. The short answer, the short description here is they had a half hour draw, but TNA could never do anything that simply. So first they had to do a twenty minute draw, and then five more minutes, and then a twenty five minute draw, and then five more minutes, and then a thirty minute draw. A draw stopped due to do blood stoppage. Mm-hmm. Kurt cannot continue, so it was a draw. <laughs> this TNA, everyone, yes. they can't just say. Go wrestle for 30 minutes, the time will run out, and you'll have a great match. No, everything has to be complicated and stupid. So it was really good. I had a lame finish, and, and, and the last 10 minutes was not as good as it should have been because of the timely interruptions. The story, I guess, was that each time the, the match was stopped, Kurt had the ankle lock on, and Jeff was saved by the bell, but it doesn't really matter. It was TNA using a pay-per-view to build to a free show. And then in the main event, Pope versus Ken Anderson. Mm-hmm. A poor main event. Crowd did not take it like a main event. They did not wrestle like it was a main event. They had a slightly above average impact match. It was, it was the the impact match where we see what happens during the commercial. And Anderson won with the mic check. And then he proceeded to... I don't know what happened. Or maybe there was lots of stuff fuck up in this match. Maybe Pope was just beating the fuck out of him the whole time. But he stood over Pope and shouted something very angry. I definitely heard the word fucking. I don't know what's going on. Pope left and shot him a double middle finger. Anderson took a bump for this. And then the show ended. You want to know why TNA will never succeed? I can think of many reasons. <laughs> well, which one are you going to say? I didn't see this show, but I can already tell you, this is why TNA will never succeed. Because they can never do anything right. <laughs> I'll never well, give you the, here, here's the example for this evening. So, TNA always has an excuse for doing something stupid. You know what I mean? They'll do something dumb... And you're like, well, why did you do that? And then there's always an excuse. Now, as you noted here, as everybody, as, as a blind man could have seen, and I didn't see the show, so I was a blind man. Pulp versus Anderson was not following Kurt Angle versus Jeff Hardy. No. Okay, a complete moron could have told you that going in. This this is not hindsight is twenty twenty. This is foresight is twenty twenty. My my favorite saying, foresight is twenty twenty. You could look at this card and go, the Pope. And Mr. Anderson are not going to be able to follow Jeff Hardy and Kurt Angle. So, it didn't work. They couldn't follow him. No. So, the question obviously is, well, why did you headline? Why did you put Pope and Mr. Anderson on last? And the explanation is, well, didn't want to go off the air with a bad finish. (laughs) So... Why did you book that fucking finish? Why did you book the bad finish? Whose fault is the bad finish? Whose fault is the fact that you had a shitty finish for Kurt Angle and Jeff Hardy? Why could you not have just had Kurt Angle and Jeff Hardy go on last, and Jeff Hardy wins, and you do it in such a way that you need a rematch? Perhaps Angle gets a visual pinfall, and then Jeff Hardy wins. I could. That took. I didn't even think about that. That's just the first thing that came into my mind. If you gave me five minutes, I could write down a list of ten better finishes than what they did here. And then you could have closed with this match. Why didn't they do that? Because they're complete idiots. Was it really that 
fucking important to do a draw here? You know what I mean? And, and was again, it really so important that you had a shitty main event on your show? I don't know. It's and, just and, and if you're going to do a draw, just do a time limit draw. You don't need multiple five minute periods and a blood stop. No, of course you do. You have to. You have to book. You have to write. You have to write. The show has to be written. It has to be written by a writer. Idiots. So anyway, there's also a point in this. Speaking of idiocy, there was a point in this match where. Kurt Angle was laying on the black mats outside the ring. Jeff Hardy went up top and hit his sent on from the post to the floor. Shockingly, Kurt Angle was injured. Mm -hmm. Hard to believe. He then wrestled 20 more minutes in a great match without looking injured, so he's the man. But still, don't do stupid shit, guys. No one's going to remember this. To the back! All right. Uh, let's get started on Impact here. I didn't see the pay-per-view. But I did see how they opened up this show, which was with a recap of the pay-per-view match with Hardy and Angle, and they did a hell of a job. This is like this is like TNA in a nutshell. So I didn't see the pay-per-view, but I heard about the finish. I heard about it. It was a great match, apparently, like four-and-a-half-star match with a goddamn horrible finish. I was aware of that, but I didn't see it. So going into this, as someone who's not seen that match, they open up with this video package that made this look like the fucking greatest match of all time. There was this dramatic music. They showed all of these awesome spots. They had people going nuts. They showed the senton to the floor and Angle cracking his ribs, and they cut backstage to Angle talking about how he was hurt and the doctor talking about how his ribs were cracked. And then they go back to the match, and it looks so fucking dramatic. And I'm like... This is awesome. And then the video package showed Eric Bischoff coming out and saying that Kurt Angle could not continue due to blood. They showed a shot of Angle with hardly any blood on him whatsoever. Bischoff sounded like he either did not care or knew how stupid this was. It was like, <laughs> you couldn't have left that part out. No, no, no. You could have just shown a video package of how awesome it was. They're probably embarrassed if thing positive in there. You know, even if Eric Bischoff would have said, like, Kurt Angle could not continue, and they showed a footage of Angle caked in blood, that would have been fine. They showed a shot of Angle after they'd wiped off the blood and there was no cut. They actually showed that in this video package. Just TNA in a nutshell right there. They can't do anything right. So, Bischoff's in the ring with both guys, and he says he'd never seen a match like that in 24 years. I'd wager to bet he's lying. Mm -hmm. He said that the problem was that because they could not determine a winner, he had to come up with a, a solution. And the solution was, after talking to Hulk, Anderson, Angle, and Hardy in a three-way at the pay-per-view. Out comes Dixie. She's had something to say. I was so proud of you that night, she said. From the moment that bell rang, you gave everything you had. You never let up and you never stopped. And the crowd chanted, thank you both. She said it was one of her favorite matches. That's what she said. That was one of my favorite matches. And then she said that she knew no one was happy with the outcome. At which point, approximately nine men went, boo! Everyone else was dead silent. So she announced that since Eric and Hogan had trumped a decision she had made about Ric Flair a few weeks ago, tonight she was going to trump Eric's decision, and she announced a three-way, uh, instead of a three-way, she announced Angle and Jeff in a rematch with no time limit, and this time she said there will be a winner, which was a lie, by the way. But regardless, Bischoff was not happy, but reluctantly he clapped along. And I should note that Dixie now has her own entrance theme. It is a country song. I don't know all the lyrics, but I could have sworn one of the lines was, I risked it all. What? I vomited in my mouth. <laughs> I, don't I know not that's a cliche, that part. But, but vomit was in my mouth when I heard that line. Yeah. So, I don't know. This is not a terrible segment. It, it, doing a rematch does make more sense than just letting them both win. And there's a point to what they're doing. I will say that. Yes. Well, they're supposed to be. They may change their mind by the pay-per-view. We had a brief segment backstage of the Pope being angry. He wanted to talk to Bischoff. He was pissed off, and then he bumped into Sting and Kevin Nash. 
Now, Sting and Kevin Nash are having the worst feud ever with Jeff Jarrett and Samoa Joe, where Nash and Sting claim to be fighting to hold on to their spots. Mm-hmm. And Jeff Jarrett says he's fighting for the young guys. So here are the young guy bumped into Sting and Nash, and they like shook hands and they were buds. Mm-hmm. Okay, I just want to throw that out there. A random camera guy this, interviewed Tommy Dreamer at a gas station in Yonkers. This fucking rule. Yeah, we're supposed to believe that TNA flew a camera crew to Yonkers, New York, for a four-second interview with Tommy Dreamer. Well, not only that, they had to find him at a random gas station. Stalk him. And keep in mind, he was on the show this evening, so it wasn't like they could have interviewed him before the show, for example. That was goofy. That's amazing. Nash with Sting against Joe with Jarrett. Went about a minute before it broke down into a brawl. <laughs> There's four men brawling wildly at ringside. The ref, of course, does not call for a DQ. He just counts both of the participants out of the ring. Yeah. I love, like, in TNA... How do I explain this? Like, in any other... How do you explain other, TNA? I don't know. In any other sport, if one guy could not continue due to blood... He'd lose. lose. It's not a draw. But in TNA, it's a draw. Yeah. And in TNA, if two men in a match go outside the ring and two other men attack them and all four men are brawling, that's not a DQ. That's no. grounds for a count <laughs> out of the ring. They're playing by a different set of rules than every other contest <laughs> in the world. Baffling. The amazing thing was, too, it's not like they're brawling out there and suddenly Joe took a shot at Sting and Sting defended himself. No. Joe and Nash were brawling and Sting flew in out of nowhere and hit Joe in the head. Mm-hmm. Right in front of the ref. And his response was to shout, One! <laughs> and he counted them out. They brawled forever. The crowd was chanting five more minutes. That was funny. It was making me laugh because this is the first draw since the last show, which also had a draw. And then they actually got five more minutes because these fuckers brawled forever. Yeah. They were punching each other and being held back and separated and then fighting more. And this brawl was so intense that in the middle of it, they cut backstage to the locker room. Madison and Tara met with Lacey. Lacey said she had not decided whose side she was on, but she was still getting dressed with these two. Yeah. I think that means she's on their side. So uh, they bitched her a bit and told her to get dressed. Nash did a promo saying this was not about wrestling, it was a war, and Sting said he had vowed to take the gloves off, and now it was getting fun. For one of us. (laughs) I was going to say, I'm still waiting for the fun part. Doug Williams and Jay Lethal for the X title. Okay. The same Jay Lethal that has not been on TV seemingly for months. They explain that Jay Lethal had earned his shot by winning matches on Explosion. <laughs> I hate to compare TNA and WWE, but in WWE, like, the Intercontinental and U.S. Championships mean jack shit. They don't mean a fucking thing. With that said... Would anyone ever get a championship match based on wins they had on Superstars? Which, by the way, has infinitely more viewers than TNA yeah. Explosion. First of all, probably not. But second of all, maybe. But if they did, they would be sure to show us a clip of somebody winning a number one contenders match or something. TNA just tells us. Of course. Jay Lethal has won a bunch of matches on Explosion. They gave us no evidence. They could be making <laughs> well, all they had a clip or two of him getting a pinfall. I don't know. I don't watch Explosion. No one watches Explosion. No one watches Impact. You think they watch the B Show? So, so and a match. Yes. Crowd was awful this evening, except during the main event. This during this match, it sounded like the place was three quarters of the way empty. I don't know if it was or if the fans just didn't care. They did a bunch of moves and such, and Lethal hit the Lethal injection and. The match was fine, but he won the title out of nowhere, and they tried to make it a big deal with fireworks, a huge confetti, confetti explosion, and the announcer's talking about a two-year journey to the title. Well, again, what shit? This is this is exactly what you just mentioned and what we've talked about a million times, where they try to make you care about a story by making up the story on the spot. If there had been, like, a real story, mm-hmm. if we'd actually seen the two-year journey of Jay Lethal, even if we'd only seen the last three weeks of his two-year journey... If we'd seen him beat men for weeks at a time, we'd care. They, a little? Yeah. This was a two-year journey that began and ended right here tonight, and he's now the champion, and confetti fell from the sky. 
There was a point. Where and he was never mentioned again on the show. No. There was no follow up to his big win. His big win was going back and getting some water and then going back to the hotel. He won this match with a move called the Lethal Injection. And you turned to me and asked, Has that move always been called that? And I thought, You know, I don't know. It's been so goddamn long since he's wrestled on Impact that we forgot what his finisher is. And now we're supposed to care that he's champion. My conclusion, yeah. by the way, was, and I quote, and I quote, not terrible, but terribly ineffective. Mm. Yeah. Profound. I what am was, very profound of late. Or was not profound. This is actually the setup for this the stupidest. This was very profound, actually. <laughs> we, we got next was the setup for the stupidest segment ever, but the setup was Abyss was dragging something around backstage, mumbling about a speed bump. Mm-hmm. We'll get to that later. That's what happened, and it left me very confused. Angle did a promo about how tough Jeff was and how he was a champion. He was going to win this match, dislocated ribs or not, go to Bound for Glory, win the title. Kurt Angle is always great, so this was fine. Then, then, Madison and Lacey with Tara against Hamada and Taylor Wilde. So Madison Tara's new entrance involves using the old Beautiful People's music. I don't even know if the Beautiful People have new music now. Or if we've got, like, two teams using oh, yeah, the same two, song. Two, two teams using the same song. Oh, awesome. So anyway, they come out, and they... First, Madison bends over, Tara slaps her on the ass, and then they kiss each other on the lips. Because they need to differentiate themselves and be non-PG. So the match went on for fucking ever. Lacey was in there... God knows how long. She has absolutely no idea what she's doing. Do we see what the match was? Hamada, Madison and Lacey versus Taylor yeah. and Hamada. Okay. Taylor and Hamada. So Hamada ends up making a comeback on Lacey. She, she, yes, she did. I guess you could call it that. She threw her foot at her, and Lacey went from standing to laying on the ground. In between points A and B, I don't know how to describe what I saw. No. Hamada should have just shot on her and beat the fuck out of her I, for the comeback. That, I, my notes read, I can only imagine what Hamada is thinking right now working with Lacey. Working is not even the right word. She could not even work with her. Lacey was out of position on, to the point where she may have been on the moon during this particular match. She may have been taking bumps on the moon as Hamada delivered kicks on the earth. This was so absolutely horrible. And they pinned her, and Madison got upset, Lacey shoved her, Tara hit the ring, punched the shit out of her, and then the beautiful people's tight jeans made the save, and everything was all right. But uh, Velvet hugged Lacey. Everybody cheered. They're back together again. And now we've got to see more matches with her. <laughs> yeah. Fuck! There was a 30-second uh, interview with Jeff Hardy. He basically said he would win. Slice gets rounder by the week. <laughs> <laughs> the Hardy boys are fattening up for winter. They are getting Hardy. They are getting hale and Hardy. Tommy Dreamer then came out in a suit with a full beard. I hated this segment. Oh, it was awful. Let me start with one thing. He has new TNA music. In the history of shitty TNA songs, and they're all <laughs> shitty, this has to be the worst. It is a very poor knockoff of Man in the Box, and they finished it I apparently sat back and said, do you know what this song needs? This song needs lyrics. <laughs> what can we sing? And so what they got, what they got was... the man in the trunk? <laughs> the man with the junk. No! Those would be <laughs> vast improvements over what they got. Which was a very nasal rendition of one guy just singing... Dreamer. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible! So he comes out... And he says, EV2 is not here. I want Fortune to please come out so I may speak to you. They all come out in suits. We then got the longest, most drawn-out, insufferable segment in the history of this business. (laughs) Fucking Tommy Dreamer proceeds to put over everybody in Fortune. Forever! He talks about... How James Storm is more talented than the Sandman. This took five minutes. And Stan Lane. He talks about how he got Kazarian. In 2010. He told Kazarian he got him his first job in WWE. This took five minutes. Then he talked about how if it had not been for TNA, Kazarian never would have met his wife. Yeah. 
Because everyone watching this fucking show knows who Kazarian's goddamn wife is. This took five minutes and sucked. So next, he said that people in WWE always said that Matt Morgan would be the next Undertaker or Kane. He's now an impact. But Tommy Dreamer had to spin this by saying, now little children can look up to him and say, I want to be the next Matt Morgan. That was such a lie, I was offended. A load of shit. My feelings were hurt. So then he talked about how Robert Roode's WWE tryout was with him. We, If I would have done a drinking game where I took a shot every time WWE was mentioned on this show... Your liver would have just burst into flame. I'd be dead right now. I would be dead of alcohol poisoning. So then he talked about how Roode had turned down his WWE deal to stay with TNA. Said Rick was the best of all time, and now, of course, he began to cry. Right. Player just stared a hole in him. And then... He starts talking about how AJ is awesome and and uh, this and that. Anyway, the, the reason this was so insufferable is, number one, it took so goddamn fucking long. It used to be, TNA is like, they could find no balance. It used to be that everything was to the back. They would, they would do a segment and immediately cut away and go to the back. Now they linger on these segments for ungodly amounts of time. Worse... And this is what really pissed me off about this segment. In the end, what happens is they beat him up. (laughs) So, 15 minutes of our life absolutely wasted to set up a Fortune vs. EV2 feud that was already going on. And in the 15 minutes between Fortune hating Tommy Dreamer and then beating him up, Tommy Dreamer panders to them like the biggest fucking pussy. Yeah. Like the biggest crybaby. He announced that he wanted a truce. Yes. He was tired of fighting. And, and he could take no more. Worse than all of that. Worse than Dreamer acting like the biggest pansy. Because he always is. It's his gimmick. He's there acting like the biggest pussy. And then he gets beaten up like a fool. But on top of all that, he's putting over the top heel faction in the company. These are... The baddest of the bad. These are the worst heels in the entire company. He puts them all over and causes all of the fans to cheer for them. (laughs) The fans are chanting for AJ. The fans are chanting, thank you, Rick. The fans are cheering all of these top heels. You wonder why nobody cares. You wonder why nobody cares. Let's design an angle to get our top heels cheered. And when all is said and done, it's not even like when they beat up Dreamer, everybody was mad. They attacked Tommy Dreamer. Everybody saw it coming. They went, boo, and they didn't care. This was a disaster. Mm -hmm. I fucking hated this with a passion. It was no good. And uh, then it went, even after it was over, so it went forever. And then a short person in white hit the ring. I actually seriously thought it was a child. It was Brian Kendrick. Yeah. They beat him up a lot, too. Then everyone disappeared. And then, in the same segment, without going to commercial, Kendrick got a microphone. He challenged anyone from Fortune to fight him. Hold on. Let me stop you there. Mm -hmm. Brian Kendrick, when he was a heel, was doing this wacky gimmick where he talked about weird shit. He was doing a wacky gimmick where he was on drugs. He's now a babyface. And to to set this up, it's like a six... Seven-on-one beatdown of Tommy Dreamer. They're trying to kill Tommy Dreamer. Brian Kendrick comes out to save who is now his friend. I don't even know why. But now Brian Kendrick is just, all of a sudden, he's a small baby face. He comes out. They beat him up, too. So all Brian Kendrick has to do is cut a fiery promo challenging someone from Fortune to a match. That's all he has to do. So what does he do? Well, he comes out, and he starts talking about vibrations and zero points He calls Fortune low vibrational reptilians. He talks about how he is a descended god. What? I don't know. His gimmick is that he is on drugs. This is why I say that. His gimmick is that he is a drug user. He's into narcotics. He came off like a crazed nut, not like a fiery baby face that people want to get behind. So they, they send out Matt Morgan in a suit. Morgan beats the shit out of him. And Kendrick suddenly, out of nowhere, hits a leg lariat for the pin. It is 2010. (laughs) And these idiots have no idea how to get a guy over. 
It's 2010, and they still think that a guy can get squashed for five minutes and get a flash pin and then run away and not come back, and that's supposed to get him over? Brian Kendrick did not get over here, and Matt Morgan looked like an idiot. Yes. Yeah, they're retarded. And then Morgan got a microphone. He said he wasn't ready. He said he was wearing a $7,500 suit. Said it didn't count. Said it didn't count. And, and he was right. <laughs> it shouldn't have. It didn't, it, didn't, it didn't accomplish nothing. And then it just ended. And then we got the stupidest thing I've ever seen. It only went like a minute. Oh, okay, so it's a waste someone. I just got to say one thing here. This made me so fucking upset. Which part? More this Morgan Kendrick match. Okay, yeah. Brian Kendrick comes out, he gets his ass handed to him, yes. and he gets a fluke win, and yeah. then he runs away. They actually think that this is like gonna gonna get the guy over. Right. Like Morgan put the guy over. UFC is a hundred percent shoot. It is a real fucking fight. Look at Anderson Silva and Chael Sonnen. Chael Sonnen talked a bunch of shit to a guy that everybody thought was unbeatable. He went out there and beat the holy fuck out of this guy for five rounds. Anderson never quit. He kept going for submission after submission. He kept making his little comebacks. And finally, at the end, he got that submission and he beat the guy. In the end, Anderson Silva looked like a guy that, on the verge of defeat, he was a fucking champion. And he came back and got the win at the end. And, and Chael Sonnen went from a guy that nobody thought had any chance of beating Anderson Silva to a guy that people look at and go, you know, maybe that guy can beat anybody on any given day. They fucking both got over to a huge fucking degree. And it's real. These guys have 100% control over everything, and they have no idea what they're doing, and they can't get anyone over. It's astounding. Anyway. Sass, people it, are going to critique what you just said and point out that the story was the same because Morgan dominated everything and he won. No, it's completely lost. different. But the difference, the difference is Silva was fighting back the entire time. Not only that, Anderson Silva was the champion. Yeah, Anderson right. Silva was already over. Yes. Anderson Silva was already the top guy in his division. Brian Kendrick is an undercard geek who's never been taken seriously. He got the shit kicked out of him and he got a fluke win. That's a thousand percent different. Mm -hmm. Ric Flair, when he was the champion and he sold and sold and sold and sold and sold and then beat the guy, that was fine. He was the fucking champion. And he was making a challenger. He was the champion and these guys almost beat him, but because he was the champion, he pulled it out of his ass at the end and both guys got over. That's completely different from being an undercard dork that never wins anyway. And he gets a fluke win over a guy after getting his ass handed to him for five minutes. They're two completely different things. Idiots. Speaking of idiocy. Okay. You recall last time we saw this? <laughs> he was dragging a speed bump through the backstage area. We saw him now. He was involved in what appeared to be what I can only call gay S&M. <laughs> There was a man with no shirt chained to a table. No, the man had a shirt on, and Abyss was ripping his clothes off. <laughs> it's been corrected. There was a man chained to a table, and Abyss tore his shirt off. There was another man chained in, like, a standing position. He was he was standing, just like you would see in some perverse porn, yeah. so I've heard. He, had his, he was bound, he had his hands tied together over his head, and he was straddling. <laughs> his feet were spread apart. Yes. Yes, and he was uh, chained there. And the cameraman was just filming this the way you would... I don't even know. I just, a man on the street interviews. Just you walk down with the camera, you shoot what you see. Oh, look at this. Here's The guy with his hands on his head, we only saw his back. But I guarantee he had a dildo in his mouth. <laughs> Probably. Probably. So then, Abyss is talking about Christ knows what. He talks about Janice, which is his stick with the nails. Then he says he now has Bob. Battery-operated boyfriend. Maybe. That's what Bob stands for. Mm. All right. In this case, it was a branding iron. Someone made a branding iron that reads 10, 10, 10. And Abyss lifted up the branding iron. He turned his back to the camera. <laughs> and uh, then, whoever this guy was, we don't know who he was. We don't know where he came from. We don't know why he was hanging out with Abyss. Maybe he paid Abyss to do this. Good half. It, may, maybe a bit, it could be kinky. It could be just a strange tattoo. Maybe this was the last before they shut down the sex items in Craigslist. Yes. This was the last yes. chance for this sure. man. It could have been. could have been. And Abyss was the only guy desperate enough to do it. So he 
held up the branding iron. He branded the guy. Mm -hmm. The guy screamed in agony for like 30 seconds. The cameraman just continued to shoot. Listen, everything Vince says is 100% true, but that is not even the dumbest part. That was all really stupid. And but it was, then... And it was like... It made you embarrassed to be a wrestling fan. Yeah. It was impossible to suspend your disbelief. It was so goddamn stupid. And it actually got worse because the man screams for like 10 seconds, and they cut back to the announcers, mm -hmm. Mike Tanay and Taz. They calmly explain. Let me repeat that. They calmly explain that Abyss was crazy, and nobody had felt his wrath quite like Rob Van Dam. We've got Rob on the phone, they say. <laughs> they just moved on. They proceed. They've seen one human being brand another. They proceed. They didn't care. They proceed to interview Rob. Now, keep in mind, the last time we saw Rob Van Dam. <laughs> this fucking show. The last time we saw Rob Van Dam, he had been killed to death by a, a board covered in nails. He just had his skin peeled off. All yes. of it. He was, he was hurt so badly that he was sent home indefinitely, and they were forced to vacate the title. And he does his first interview since that time, and it is every Rob Van Dam interview we have ever heard. He's happy. He's positive. Probably stoned. They asked him about the title, and he says, and I quote, I'm a little bummed right now. Those are his exact words. I'm a little bummed right now. He says... But I'm fine. I'll be back in the impact zone next week. I'm training every day. Life is good. I'm going to be back better than ever. <laughs> Keep in mind they have not even filled his championship void yet. He's already going to be back on the show next week, and he's fine. And as he's talking about this, the announcers are smiling. They're saying, ha, 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 great news. See you next week, Rob. Meanwhile, a man's fucking being branded. When this show ended, I thought, well, I was boring and stupid, and I didn't really care, and I came upstairs. The more we talk about this, the angrier I'm getting. <laughs> I'm starting to sweat. It is very hot in this I'm house. I'm rubbing my face and head repeatedly. I can't take this shit. <laughs> the man was being branded. 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 Backstage in the Impact Zone, as far as we can tell. No one... I mean, I know Joe was kidnapped and nobody called the authorities. But here we have video evidence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's move on. God, this... I want to talk about Generation Me. Go for it. Let me talk about Generation Me. This is another example of, of TNA not having a clue. As noted, everything in TNA is straight out of the 90s. So... They've got these two guys, these two young fellas, and their gimmick is that they're Generation Me. And first off, when I saw them down at Bola, they were great heels because they came out and they're indie guys, but they're signed to TNA, and everybody in PWG hates them for it. And so they get great heat by talking about how they've got to do their match and get on a plane and go to the Impact Zone. They're fucking awesome in PWG. In here, in HD, in close-up, they both look about 14 years old. So they come out here, and they do a promo saying, we represent the me generation. Yes. Everybody. The me generation was the 80s. The 80s was a period when everyone was out for themselves. Everybody was trying to win at all costs. This may have moved into the 90s a little bit, but... Phil, okay? Phil is the same age as Generation Me. Phil, he goes to anime conventions. He goes to church. He wears bells. Yes, in some ways he's an outlier. But 20-year-olds today are not the Me generation. They are completely different. Kids today are completely fucking different from kids in the 70s and the 80s and kids in the 90s. I just was watching this, and I was like, you have absolutely no idea what kids today are really like. They're not like this. So these two goofballs come out here. They look ten. They demand the guns come out and give them the titles. Saban comes out. He attacks them. They double-team him. 
Shelly supposedly has a back or neck injury. Now they give uh, Saban a a double DET, and he sells it like he has a neck injury. And some people said boo. <laughs> that is how I wrote it down, and that is exactly what happened. That is accurate. That there were about accurate. ten people that went boo. I no just like buddy cared. He actually had to say, and that was a direct quote. We represent the me generation. I figured out that was the idea the first time they were called Generation Me. I didn't need to explain to me. I'm yeah, not that fucking young. Let me explain this, though. I, I've been coaching since 1995. No, before that. I was coaching in high school. I've been coaching since 1992. The kids I used to have in 1992, the young kids, were goddamn hellions. These were the worst children that have ever walked the face of the earth. Except probably kids when I, in the 70s were probably worse. Kids I coach nowadays are nothing like that. They're all nice. They all want to get along. They don't like to argue. They don't like to debate. They're all friendly. They're nothing like this. And Vince Russo has no idea what... what he's just clueless. This whole company is clueless. If there is a generation me in today's youth, it's look at me. They just want attention of any kind. They don't want... Pride and honor and championships. Yeah, but what, you know what's stupid it's about just, this, though? You know what else is, else is stupid about this? Talking about them representing the me generation. They're the same age as Jay Lethal. That, well, there's They're that the same age as the guns. All of these nice young kids in TNA. Anyway, main event. Angle and Hardy. They actually had a good match. I shouldn't say actually. They had a good match. So, they go and they go and they go. It actually... <laughs> I guess WWE does this, but it's stupid when they do it, too. The main event is supposed to be a no-time-limit match. Because of the pay-per-view, they went 20 minutes, they had a five-minute overtime, they had another five-minute overtime, and they never determined a winner. So now they're going to have a match with no time limit. So they start 10 minutes before the end of the show. Yeah. So, of course, it goes long. It goes into uh, reaction. They're now trying to trick us into watching this show. <laughs> which Maybe is they want to pay attention. Its ratings fall every single week. Now they're tricking us into staying to watch that show. Amazingly, my DVR didn't cut off until after the match was over. So I don't know how they figured out how to do that, but they did. They wrestle and wrestle and wrestle, and ref takes a bump. Another ref hits the ring, and uh, they get to a point where they're doing ankle locks, and both refs are, are right there. And I thought, remember when Samoa Joe flipped his lid because they did time cues? and they gave away the fact that we were going to have a time limit draw. No one got mad that they had two referees in the ring for the last five minutes. You know what I mean? Did that not telegraph exactly what was going to fucking happen? I don't find that nearly as stupid as what finally did happen. They both do an ankle lock on each other. It's Don Fry and uh, Ken Shamrock all over again. Their shoulders are down, so the referees pin them both. Yes. Yeah. So, for those keeping track... This is now the second match in a row that Kurt Angle has not won. And, in fact, he was pinned in this match. He still has not retired. And you wonder why no one cares about stipulations. So Bischoff comes out, and he says, I'm going to overrule the overruling of Dixie. It is back to a three-way at the pay-per-view. Dixie does not overrule the overruling of her overrule. She just looks at the ring with a blank stare and left. I believe she said, what? And then she got all her stuff and walked out. Perhaps we were supposed to think she was upset. I assume she was bored. <laughs> or happy. Perhaps she relieved, may have been overjoyed. Relieved the show was over after it got long. Yeah, this show sucks. We did not talk about what I think was the most important part about the main event, the most notable thing, and that was the commentary. I don't mean Taz. I don't mean Mike Tanay. I mean Mr. Kennedy. Came out late to do commentary, like right before the commercial break, and he sat down, and he came back, and he was talking. This had to be the worst wrestler doing commentary segment of all time. The guy could not finish his sentences. He would start a thought, such as, wow, man. Then he would pause, and then Taz and they would say something and try to spur further thought from him, and they would fail. It took him about, when they, when they were talking about possibly doing another match with Angle, it took him about four tries to say this, but he finally got out that Kurt led him led him, everyone, to the best match of his career. 
Yeah. It's fake, everyone. He said pro wrestling is fake. Despite his shirt, he exposed it as being fake here. Mr. Anderson was just so ungodly, ridiculously boring on commentary. If you're an Anderson fan, I encourage you to seek down the show and watch the segment because you will not be a fan no more. I, well, I, I just want someone who is an Anderson fan to, to try to tell me that they actually thought that this was good because it's impossible. Well, then they're just bullshitting you. To the back! All right, let's get going on Impact while I look around here. Vinny, get started. Well, first of all, I'll start my computer. See if we can get this warmed up here. Here we go. Impact opened with a recap of last week's show, which had Dixie overriding Eric's decision, and then Eric overriding Dixie's decision. So we were told here that the main, main feud of Impact is now Dixie Carter versus Eric Bischoff. Who cares? <laughs> I just like this whole... Uh, so, yes, they open up and they show the recap of the deal last week, and Dixie is all pissed off because Eric changed her match from one-on-one to a three-way after she changed it from a three-way to one-on-one, and she storms off and she's all mad. And This would be understandable that she was overruled if, you know, it actually fucking mattered what the match was. <laughs> that? Who fucking cares if it's a singles match or a three-way? What does it even matter? Or what is she pissed off it about? It would make sense if, you know, we, it was established in the first segment that she has power over Eric, and then by the end, Eric had power over her. Apparently, it's just whoever says first. Whoever, does, whoever or excuse me, whoever goes last. Because once the decision has been made, it can be overridden. But if it has been overridden, it cannot be changed. Well, it's like, no, this is what I'm saying. Let's say that, like, we were about to merge, and Dave and I had to ch- decide what we were going to call the, the website. And it was like, the options were figure4online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com or Parakeet Weekly. Obviously, one's What better. the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I'm just saying, if, if I wanted to use figure4online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com and for whatever strange reason Dave wanted to call this website Parakeet Weekly and and he overruled me and and forced me to call it Parakeet Weekly then yeah, I'd be fucking pissed off okay? but if the options were figure4online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com or wrestlingobserver.com slash figure4weekly.com, if he overruled me by changing the order of the words, who fucking gives a fucking fuck? Nobody. They've added a guy to a fucking match. Who cares? She acted like this was the most traumatic moment in the history of Impact. Not all of their pay-per-views knew it doing no buys, not losing $30 million in five years, the fact that a guy is added to a match. That's why I found this to be dumb. So our, our opener here was Rob Terry versus Abyss. i got to see if there's a parakeet weekly. As, Ro- <laughs> As Rob Terry made his way to the ring, the camera cut backstage where there was a lot of pushing and shoving, and we were told, we were told RVD was in there. And again, who cares? There's not, by the way. Yeah, they cut backstage to, to I believe, RVD being held back. And I say I believe because I had to rewind it to find out what the hell was going on. It was only upon rewinding we realized Rob Van Dam was even in this picture. They showed this for approximately two seconds and then cut away. It was a mess. Yeah, it, it wasn't even like he was being held back. It was just a bunch of people shouting. Then we had Rob tearing Abyss, which was a lumbering, clunky match. The, the lumbering oafs did spots. It was actually so clunky that it was comical, but then... It went on and on and on. And finally, they cut to RVD and RVD Jeff. RVD and Jeff were whispering backstage. They start heading down to the ring. Meanwhile, Abyss is doing nothing. He's outside of the ring. He's outside of the ring for about an hour. And then finally, he hits Terry with the barricade, and the ref disqualifies him. He's disqualified. He's no longer qualified to engage in competition because he hit a man with a guardrail. Yes, because Lord knows... Abyss can't pin Rob Terry. No. You must protect Rob Terry. So RVD started coming through the crowd. This was awesome. I mentioned this to Dave when he was talking about the show. Rob comes out and he's got a couple of bandages on. He's got like a bandage on his head and he's got like his elbow his shins were up, covered. a shin. He's just like it taped up in random places. Now if you remember the beating, he was bloody head to toe. Uh-huh. So like apparently Parts of his body healed, and others not only did not heal, but there's still a danger of, of blood coming out of these. these sure. Because he's 
bandaged right. after a month. This was so hokey. So he comes limping down the stairs. Jeff Hardy, by the way, didn't know where to be found. Of course not. He explained he was, in the Whispering segment, he had explained he was leading Rob ringside like Rob had never been to the impact zone before, didn't know how to get to the ring. So Rob appears in the stairs. He is limping and carrying a chair. Abyss was scared at first, then he grabbed Janice, and they faced off, and then nothing happened, and they were separated by security. Like two, maybe three weeks ago in the show, Abyss brawled with Steve Richards for like ten minutes, and then immediately thereafter brawled with Rhino for like ten minutes. This week, security everywhere. Mm -hmm. RVD wanted to talk to Bischoff, and he did a promo, which actually was better than I had expected. He was at least mad, which was very unlike how he was on the phone when he did not give a fuck at all. He said he was bummed. Yeah. So he cuts his angry promo about how the tournament's already set in stone, even though they didn't clear it with him, blah, blah, blah. So he wants a shot at the winner, and... uh, yeah, he wants a visit the pay-per-view on 10-10-10. So Bischoff said, let's do it, and there's your match. Then, before Bischoff could leave, the Pope interrupted. This is all one segment. Mm-hmm. A long match with Abyss, his confrontation with RVD, and then Pope and Bischoff. So the Pope started listing all these guys he had beaten, wanted to know what Rob had done to get a title shot before he got his, wanted to know why Kurt Angle and, and Jeff Hardy were in the title match when they did not win in the tournament. Fair point. He called Bischoff a con man. Bishop talked him out of it, or whatever it, was, whatever it was, and they decided to have a meeting. Backstage. Hold on. i got to talk more about this segment. He mentioned that Bischoff was a con man. Has there been any evidence on TV of Bischoff being a con man? Am I missing a great con that Bischoff has been involved in? I, I can't think of one. I don't care. I'm trying not to, to get angry. But this is the show. point. This is the point. Yes. Pope comes out and talks about how Eric Bischoff is a con man. There's absolutely no evidence of this that we've ever seen on TV. So he accuses Eric of being a con man, and what does the audience do? They go dead silent. True. Every... I mean, seriously. We talk about this every week, but, like, when are they going to figure out... No, No, they won't. I know it's a stupid question. It's a rhetorical question. Is it that hard to figure out that nobody gives a fuck about these inside references or these imaginary references to shit that we're clearly, supposed to... Clearly it is. I mean, every time... I mean, this, this is not like, you know, sometimes. This is every time. Every time someone starts about talking about politics or people being held down or con men or pushes or whatever, the audience goes dead silent because they don't fucking care. And every single week, and they do it again. They don't care because they don't know. Well, <laughs> that's I'm beside the point. At this point, the point should just be that every time they talk about this shit, nobody cares. So fucking knock it off. I want to talk about what happened next. Because this was an amazing segment that became even more amazing later in the show. So, the beautiful, beautiful people got back together. Velvet and Angelina and Lacey. I think. I think Lacey's right to go with them. She's certainly here with them here. Because Madison and Velvet, or excuse me, damn it. Angelina and Velvet were getting their makeup done, and they were talking and being gossipy and happy. Lacey storms in, and they ask her what's wrong, and she went on a loud, profane tirade about how Madison and Tara had beat her up and left her laying. Now she was not going to stand for this. Then she stomped out of the room, and Angelina and Velvet looked at her, and then they kind of laughed it off like the whole thing was silly. And if they think it's silly, why shouldn't we think it's silly? It actually gets me even more amazing later. I just like the idea that uh, it's always referenced in TNA how much makeup the girls wear. <laughs> that too. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like every once in a blue moon you'll see Jan, the makeup lady in WWE, but usually she's like doing someone's hair or something like that. It's never, let me paint your face because without your makeup you're ugly. <laughs> but right. like... The, the 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 women in TNA are constantly being shown putting on makeup. It's amazing. Anyway, so uh, next segment was Chris Sabin and Jeremy Buck. You know, I've, I've mentioned many times that the Young Bucks are, are far more... I guess to me, it's like they're better heels than baby faces. They show far more personality. But at the same time, you know, I remember in like 1998 when I first started wrestling... And I was 23 years old or whatever, and I wanted to be a heel. 
really bad. And Buddy just shot this idea down saying, you know, look at you. You're small. You're not a heel. And the reality is, yes, I could. I may have had far more personality as a heel than a babyface. In fact, I can guarantee I would have because I was a shitty babyface. But the point is, yes, these guys might have more personality as heels, but they look ten. It is impossible <laughs> to take these men seriously as heel threats. They're tiny, ten-year-old-looking heels. They beat up Chris Sabin. The match was fine. The storyline was that Chris Sabin was there to get revenge on the Bucks for hurting Alex Shelley's neck. And keep in mind, on the last show, they hurt Chris Sabin's neck. Apparently, he just heals faster. So he won with a roll-up after selling the entire match. Then they beat him up again, DDT'd him on, the, on his neck, and stole the bells. So there you go. I was totally fine with this. There's a million things to complain about beforehand. Storyline makes sense. The booking makes sense because you, you can, you know, the, the, the good guy won with a roll-up, so it wasn't decisive, and then he was double-teamed and beaten up again, and he stole his belt. So, no complaints. What I will complain about is that Velvet Sky and Lacey Von Eric were shown walking around backstage. Now, here's where I think you're confused. I think Lacey was bitching about the heels. She was really upset about something the heels had done, and so she was cutting a promo on them, and the beautiful people were back there listening to her. Okay. She wasn't mad at the beautiful people. No, no, no. I, I it was stupid for her to be I smiling. understood that. I understood that. I was, it, was, it was just bewildering how much they didn't care about her being angry about Tara and Madison. Well, but here's the problem. Here's the other problem you have. And this is not your fault. Somebody emailed me uh, Thursday night, and they noted that they were watching Impact, and they were watching a certain fan in, like, the third row. And later on in the show, the fan had mysteriously moved several rows up and was wearing different clothes. Hmm. Because you see, they tape this fucking show out of order. And so what you have is you have a segment where Lacey is so angry that she's swearing and yelling fuck and bitch and such every other word. And she's out of her mind. And the beautiful people say we've never seen her like this. And then two segments later, she's happily walking and smiling yes. to the ring. Yes. That's because they don't know what they're doing. Twenty minutes later, Velvet and Lacey virtually arm in arm, happy, just good friends. Yes. A terrible show. We then saw an advertisement for an amazing product, Best of the Asylum. Yes. The best the TNA had to offer when they were doing shows at the fairgrounds of Tennessee. And they were sure to plug how they had guys like CM Punk there for, like, six matches or whatever it was. So, yes, you can go watch Ken Shamrock wrestle if you want to. You can watch the Flying Elvises. You can watch... I was going to say it was probably better than stuff today until you mentioned the Flying Elvises. That's TNA a, today is, in fact, better than the Flying Elvises. It is. Or, or the Penis Twins. Taylor Wilde and Hamada against Velvet and Lacey. Hamada versus Lacey was not nearly as awful as it was last time. It still sucked. Lacey performed a Hurricane Rana, I guess. <laughs> Although, I, I cannot really describe it as such. I would say Lacey attempted a Hurricane Rana. Yeah. It, it fell involved, apart. It, yes, it did. That is true. It involved her climbing the second rope, slipping and climbing back down, and starting over again. Yeah. Taz referred to this move as, and this is a direct quote, the old, uh, the old, yeah. This was awful. <laughs> then came the finish. It broke down into a four-way. It, uh, the ref was distracted. Madison Rain hits the ring and clonks Lacey in the back of the head with a motorcycle helmet. Lacey, I guess, takes a bump. Anyway, like a second later, she's back on her feet. She is holding the back of her head, and she's swaying as if a, a strong wind has kicked up. And then a flying kick finishes her off. Listen, it is actually criminal. It is a criminal act to put this girl in the ring. She is going to kill herself, or has someone is going to kill her. It is just her bumps, her selling, her her offense, her defense. It's just a complete disaster. It's a complete disaster. So please, have her be a beautiful valet. That is a perfect role for her. Have her say goofy things and be a beautiful valet. Do not put her in the fucking ring. That sucked. We had a video package for Jesse Neal. He's been a regular character on television for at least a year. This package had nothing new. We had Dixie Carter at the announce desk. I always feel the need to put that in capital letters. Like it's important. 
So she said she had an announcement. It was that the main event of the live show on October 7th would be a battle royal with everyone from the Bound for Glory card. That was the announcement. She then referenced, Taz was talking about her Twitter or whatever, some other announcement she was talking about, and she said, quote, that was months ago. And then she implied there would be another announcement on October 7th. We had Joe and the Pope. It was fine. It was stupid at the finish when Pope starts making a comeback, and he's throwing back elbows, and Joe is bumping around. Joe outweighs the man by 50 pounds. He should not be bumping for back elbows. So then he went up for an atomic drop. It was all goofy. So Pope goes for the double knees when out comes Jeff Jarrett. Out comes Sting. Out comes Nash. They start brawling. Now, in any other competent wrestling company in the world, when you have a brawl outside the ring, the action in the ring stops. A man puts on a hold, for example, because you can't watch both things at the same time. Not TNA. Every time there was a match on this show where there was outside of the ring brawling, the guys in the ring continued to do their spots and go to their finish. So you were forced to try to watch two things at once. The cameramen were forced to attempt to film two things at once. The director was attempting to try and get everything on TV. Everybody failed at their task, and it became a complete mess, which was what this was. Joe ended up winning, then brawled with all of the guys outside. He uh, he went for Nash's eye, because it's a shoot, brother, and nobody broke it up. And they're brawling and brawling and brawling and brawling and brawling, and then suddenly they just go to the back. <laughs> Christy is interviewing EV2. It was so important that Christy talked to Tommy Dreamer. They cut away from this brawl. And, by the way, the brawl overshadowed, by a great degree, the fact that Pope had just lost a match to be put in the world title match of the pay-per-view. Yeah, never mentioned again. So, back to the back. Christy's talking to Tommy Dreamer. He announced that they had talked to Eric or Dixie or somebody, and they were getting a lethal lockdown match against Fortune at the pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. He also announced that tonight there would be a ladder match... Sabu versus AJ Styles, the winner would get the man advantage for his team. Yeah. You forget to mention, it's a lethal lockdown match, and they have to do a match to determine which team is going to get the man advantage. It's Angle and Sabu, or AJ and Sabu. It is not just a fucking singles match. Of course not. It's a ladder match. Of course. It is a ladder match, a random ladder match, to determine which team gets the man advantage in a lethal lockdown match. I could not make this up if I tried. And it wasn't even a very good match. Then we had Anderson coming out and calling Kurt down to the ring. He did some comedy where, for example, he said that they did not come to TNA to play politics, which, by the way, was met with silence from the crowd. He said that they weren't there to play politics or swing from the balls of the boss backstage. And then he paused and said, well, that would be impossible. And approximately five men of the 1,200 people in the asylum laughed. Everyone else was dead silent. He cut this promo about how he respected Kurt, but he was going to be three seconds better than him at the pay-per-view. And Kurt said he was going to beat Ken because his career was on the line. And finally, Anderson raised his hand and said, Let's hear it for Kurt Angle, everybody, for the very last time. And that was actually a good line. This was fine. It was merely boring. And boring is a giant upgrade for the show. And then we got what I may seriously consider the best moment in Impact history. <laughs> Ric Flair was backstage giving a pep talk to his men, telling them they were going to win the Leaf Lockdown match the paper. You telling AJ he was green, he was going to beat Sabu tonight. And then Ric Flair got iced. Yes. Now, <laughs> if you were not with us in Vegas, there was a... Uh, Basically, Smirnoff Ice made a series of intentionally shitty YouTube videos of people playing pranks on each other and icing each other and forcing you to drink their product. And it was so fantastically over the top stupid, over the top stupid, that many of our board members reenacted it and yeah. were icing each other throughout the Vegas convention weekend. So Rick Flair got iced. He had no idea what was going on. They called him bro repeatedly, which was great. They explained that he had to get down on one knee and drink this bottle of cheer beer, and he explained this was nothing. He was offended yes. at the idea that he only had to chug a single beer. Yes, so he got down on one knee, he chugged it immediately, and then he got up and he just was Ric Flair. 
He, he began was, to strut. He was slapping himself. He was strutting. He was going woo repeatedly. I, I, I can't do this justice because Rick Goddamn Flair and I'm merely an EV. Yeah. But this was this was fucking great. Phenomenal. Rick Just, Flair. If let me listen. If anybody else in any wrestling company or actually any anywhere in the world tried to do the ice gag yes. in like September of 2010. <laughs> Like, if... Ridiculous. If somebody tried to ice John Morrison, fail. It would have been so ridiculously stupid in WWE to ice anybody. But you can get away with icing Ric Flair. Oh, God, yes. You can, in fact, in 2030, <laughs> you could ice Ric Flair and it would still be awesome. <laughs> because it's the same reason that Ric Flair made musical chairs work. Ric Flair can make anything work. <laughs> Maybe this would have worked with Shawn Michaels. He's, he's the other one that I think could have probably made this work. In a different Anybody way. else, don't bother. Yeah. So they, per- they picked the perfect guy at the perfect time for a perfect fucking segment. And the best part was, I don't think they ever even mentioned the name of the product, which means this is not product placement. They just thought it would be a funny idea for a skit, and they were correct. Maybe they really iced him. I, it may have been a shoot. <laughs> and you do it every week at this point. I love this with all my heart. Nash and Sting I do not to, love this with all my heart. Nash and Sting trying to get info from the Pope. I don't know about what. Pope, didn't, Pope didn't either is the best part. No, no one knows what they're talking about. That, that is the angle. Yeah. The storyline here is nobody knows what they're arguing about or why they're feuding. Pope, they, they said they wanted information from Pope about broads. Pope said he was seeing a lot of broads. Nash, Long story short, let's cut to the chase. No, it's, it's, this detail is important. Nash said, test mocker. Pope said, you know. And this somehow convinced Pope to side with him. They they are both fucking Brooke, and neither seemed overly concerned about this revelation. Hmm. Bros. There you go. AJ and Sabu in a ladder match for the man advantage and lethal lockdown. Yes, could not just do the singles match. They used tables, ladders, chairs. It was all right. Sabu is not moving well. So Foley came out. Fortune beat him up. Dreamer came out. Somebody attacked him. Fortune and EV2 all ran out together. Dudes were running wild. Sabu did a dive. People were beating up dudes in the ring. Finally, Sabu was going to climb. Storm broke him over the head with a beer bottle. AJ got the thing for the win. So the heels actually have the man advantage. It only took him six years to figure out how to do lethal lockdown. <laughs> yeah. So congratulations to TNA for learning something. So I just love that. Let's just pretend, because it's pro wrestling. The idea of pro wrestling is you're supposed to pretend it's real, okay? (laughs) Everyone knows it's not, but you're supposed to pretend it's real. That's the fun of it. If we pretend this is real, the people that run TNA are so fucking stupid that they thought a no-disqualification match to determine the man advantage in a lethal lockdown would not involve everyone in the fucking match running in. What idiots? Or they did and they didn't care. Or they did and they didn't care. I didn't, I honestly, I didn't, I was not bothered by it at all because it, they're building to a team versus team match, so why not have both teams out there doing a bunch of shit? And it was no DQ because it was a ladder match, so who cares? <laughs> because it was a ladder match. They're so uncreative, they couldn't find a way to do this without throwing something stupid in there. Hmm. You have to get the man advantage in a ladder match. Can you say no DQ match? So we had a segment backstage where Jeff Hardy and RVD were talking about how much they love each other. Rob left. The camera stayed on Jeff for several awkward seconds. I was wondering if he was being introspective, questioning whether he really did love RVD. And then I guess Abyss just got him. The camera went sideways. We heard Abyss screaming a lot and stomping on things. How about this? How about this for an idea instead? You do a singles match between two guys for the man advantage. And the teams come down to ringside, but nobody actually interferes. They come down to ringside. Somebody takes the ref. The babyface has the win, but the ref's back is turned. Another one of the heels jumps in the ring, hits the babyface. The heel ends up getting the cover. The ref turns around, counts the pin. The heels fuck their way into the man advantage because they're heels, and that's what they fucking do. They cheat. And then all of the teams jump in the ring and have a big fucking brawl. Never work. <laughs> sure. That would never work. That would never work. So we had a business pro, uh, a promo. He carried Jeff Hardy's dead body to the ring with him, laid him out. 
He cut the same promo he's been cutting for about eight years now, it seems. Talked about them and 10-10-10 and Jeff Hardy and RVD. RVD limped out there to brawl with him. Got beat up in the show ended. You know, when it's revealed that, that uh, Eric and Hogan are, are heels and they're trying to fuck Dixie, literally and figuratively or whatever, and uh, and that's the big secret that Nash and all these guys have been talking about, it's not going to retroactively make those segments any better. No. No, it isn't. In fact, it may make them worse. Because if that's the big reveal, why wouldn't Nash and Sting just tell us? Well, they got to wait till 10-10-10. Why? Timing is everything, Vinny. 